thy word. Showers of blessing, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Amen. We may say. Showers of blessing are about the only kind of showers we need at this point. We have been rained out, and uh, it's, a, it's a blessing that we had some uh, work done around the property, including the weather stripping on this door up here, so we didn't get a creek into the auditorium the other day. Uh, but uh, we need to get that uh, roof work done pretty quick here, because I think there are some new leaks that appeared over the course of the winter. But such is life. We'll get that taken care of soon. Trust that you all had a good uh, couple of days since Sunday. Welcome to our midweek service. It is good to see you folks. Good crowd on the bus, it looks like, as well. Uh, before we get the service started, I just wanted to mention I will be trying to get around to pass out. Uh, I have the uh, prizes for completing the challenge for Bible reading. So that was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this requires a little bit of explanation, so I'm going to explain it now. And then uh, you'll obviously see it up close when you get it. But I put together a couple of little things that I personally use when it comes to marking my Bible. I'm very particular when it comes to writing in my Bible, what pen I use, and things that don't bleed through the pages, and so on and so forth. So I have a bunch of different color highlighters. I'll let you pick which one you want. But it is a gel highlighter made specifically for highlighting in your Bible. There's an archival ink pen as well for marking in your Bible. So it won't bleed. It won't run. It won't uh, go through the paper, anything like that. And it won't fade. And then here's a nifty little ruler with the books of the Bible on it. So those that like really sharp lines, if you underline things, uh, this will help you out as well. So again, a little bit of explanation, but you'll get this if you uh, did the Bible reading challenge the other day. So thank you folks for your participation in the spring program. And uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day you've given us. Thank you for the chance to be in your house tonight. Lord, thank you for the beautiful weather today. And I pray that you give safety to those as they travel. Uh, for those that are still on the way to the service, and uh, bless all that will be done in your house tonight. Be with Pastor as he uh, does the Bible study. I pray that you'd be with the uh, kids' class, and then also be with the teen class tonight, Lord. I pray that your name would be glorified in everything that's said and done. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right, here are your midweek announcements. Soul winning. Don't miss our regular organized soul winning time and bus visitation and Bible giveaway. On Saturdays at 10 a.m., spring program. This week's emphasis is go deeper in your giving. So if you would like to participate, please have your special offering ready today. Today's the last day for that. Ladies' luncheon. Ladies want to get away. That's the theme. All ladies are invited to a luncheon with food and fellowship this Saturday, May 7th at 1230 p.m. Our special speaker will be uh, Miss, uh, Miss Jean Mrs. Jeannie Nichols, and there is no cost for the luncheon. Mother's Day, all mothers will be honored on Mother's Day, Sunday, May the 8th. Our special music and special speaker all day will be Pastor Stephen Nichols. You don't want to miss that. And then we have our church anniversary and picnic on Sunday, May the 22nd. Everyone is invited to attend the anniversary service and the picnic immediately after at Delwood Park at the Eagle Pavilion. You don't want to miss this exciting day. Happy 38th anniversary. A couple things. Um, don't forget that this uh, Sunday morning for Sunday school, the adults and teens will be meeting here in the auditorium for our guest speaker. So that's uh, this Sunday. The adults and teens will meet here in the auditorium for the Sunday school hour. And also tonight, after the service is over, this would not include bus workers, of course, uh, but uh, we need a lot of hands. We need a lot of help. Uh, we're going to set this auditorium up for the ladies' meeting this coming Saturday. So uh, tonight when the service is over, those that can help out, we need to basically take up all the chairs and get tables in here, then set up for the ladies' luncheon. If you're visiting or if you brought a visitor, raise your hand. We want to recognize any visitors. Anybody? Okay. Let's go ahead and stand. Well, we do have one. Okay. And uh, right, are you a visitor? Okay, what's your name? <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Claire. Well, good to have you. God bless you. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you for coming. Uh, I can see the resemblance there. Yeah, mother-daughter there. Okay, good to have you. Thank you so much 
for coming, being part of our midweek service. Let's go ahead then and stand. And if you have a songbook, you can grab one and, and we'll sing one more song. Then we'll have the Kids for Christ dismissed. The teens will go to the, uh, the foyer classroom. And then the adults will remain here in the auditorium. Number 300. Oh, say, but I'm glad. We'll sing the first and second of 300. <laughs> a song in my heart today, something I never had. Jesus has taken my sins away. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Jesus has come and my cup's overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Second is the last. Wonderful, marvelous love he brings into the heart that's sad through darkest tunnels a soul can see oh say what i'm glad oh say what i'm glad i'm glad oh say what i'm glad jesus has come and my cup's overrun oh say what i'm glad amen 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 all right we can be dismissed to our Respective uh, departments, uh, Kids for Christ and teens and adults, if you will, please get out your blue sheets. All right, am I on? No microphone. Are we good? Okay, is it loud enough? Okay, good. All right, go ahead and take your... Prayer sheet out, please. And we'll get right into that. And then we'll add a couple more as well. And let me get my glasses. You know, Pastor Abe was talking about some leaks. We came in yesterday morning, I guess it was, Pastor Abe and I. And um, it was uh, leaking in that office on top of the photocopier. And the whole top of the photocopier was wet. We thought, oh boy, you know, so we let it dry, we dried it out, then we let it set for a while, we didn't want to do anything until we felt like it was totally dry. Then we, we gave it a shot, you know, tried it, turned it on, tried it, and it was working fine, so praise the Lord for that. That could have been a very costly uh, situation, but thankfully uh, the photocopier was okay, so we had a little leak, and... And uh, Brother John is uh, going to get to the uh, shingles. That There's some shingles that are missing right above that, this area over here above the office and the kitchen, a little kitchenette area, a little bit of a fellowship hall. That was going to be done last Saturday in our work day, but because uh, it rained all morning long, uh, we weren't able to get to that. We got to several other things, but we didn't get to that. So hopefully we'll be tackling that pretty soon. We were able to move some gravel from the lawn on the north parking lot back onto the parking lot. We were able to uh, uh, paint the uh, baptistry inside, which is a, a tremendous improvement. And uh, also some doors got fixed and uh, weather stripping and different things. So. We did get some things done, but other things are still uh, yet to be accomplished. All right, let's look at the uh, prayer request sheet. Continue to pray for the spring program. And um, this uh, coming Sunday, I believe it is the, um, it's the family altar, I think. I think it's the family is coming. Yeah, this would be the... Um, the last week of the, pro of the program would be uh, the challenge of, of having a family time uh, during the week where you read your Bible together. If it's just a couple, then obviously if you don't have kids, it'd just be the husband and wife. But if it's a family, uh, one child or more, then that's the idea is to try to go deeper into our family time around the Word of God. So uh, pray for that. And, of course, pray for the... Um, for this coming Sunday, well, let's let's go back. Let's pray for Saturday. 
Pray for the ladies' luncheon. And I think there are over 60 ladies signed up. And uh, that's a blessing. And um, Mrs. Uh, pa- uh, pastor's, uh, the pastor's wife, Mrs. Jeannie Nichols, of course, is our speaker. By the way, they're from California. They, uh, he pastors in California. And um, I think it's called the Regency Baptist Church in the Sacramento area, I believe. And so they're coming all the way out here from California. And they do sing. They do provide special music. So we're looking forward to that. But she'll be speaking this Saturday. So pray for that, the ladies' luncheon, and uh, that that will go well and that you ladies will be blessed. And then the next day, pray for this Sunday. That'll be Mother's Day. And Pastor Nichols will be speaking all day, Sunday morning, Sunday night. So pray for him and pray for that day. And I uh, want to encourage you to, um, you know, bring um, uh, anyone you know that's a mother. And um, they will be honored. Of course, Mother's Day, we always honor the mothers here at Grace Baptist Church. And so um, if, uh, invite some moms to come. And every mom will get a gift, a special gift this uh, Sunday. And, of course, uh, Mother's Day, uh, I'm sure there'll be some type of Mother's Day uh, uh, presentation. And so uh, pray for this weekend. And then I want you to pray for Dennis Hobart. Dennis uh, is recovering from his surgery. That took place on Monday. No, Tuesday. It took place yesterday. And it went, went well. So we're thankful for that, and the surgery went well. And I got a text from Kelly about an hour ago or so, and uh, he was being released as she uh, was texting, I guess. And So that's why she and Kevin are not here tonight, because they, they're at the hospital to pick him up and take him home. And But he, um, he is being released this evening, so we're thankful for that. And then uh, continue to pray for me, and uh, the gout is better, the inflammation in the eyes is a little bit better. Uh, the soonest I could get an appointment for the doctor was this Monday, next week, Monday. Uh, so pray for that. And then also, uh, this morning I preached a funeral service uh, for the Ledvina family. Now that would be Phil Grossi's brother's mother-in-law. <laughs> Uh, if you can put those pieces together. Uh, so that was over in New Lenox at the Kurtz Funeral Home there. And uh, that was at 11 o'clock this morning. I preached that uh, funeral, gave the gospel to several people, and then at the graveside service as well. Uh, the only folks from GBC were, was uh, Phil and Karen and Catherine went. Uh, otherwise, I don't think I knew. Well, I knew a couple of his family. But that was about it. And I don't know of any professions of faith that were made. No hands were raised, but the gospel was given. And only eternity will tell us uh, what results came by that. And uh, so pray for that family. Barb Snyder, continue to pray for her. Margaret Temko, still struggling with shingles. And Cheryl Cleland, that's Scott's mom, pray for her and comfort and selling of her house as well. Barb Bolton, and uh, for Kathleen. Uh, recovery from knee surgery and infection. John Gennard, pray for him. Pray for Tyler Gennard. Will wanted me to pass that along. Pray for him. And also Caitlin. Uh, and then uh, uh, pray for the rest of these. Uh, and these have been on for a while, the rest of these. So let's pray for, for each and every one. Then also for the cancer list on the bottom right. I'm sorry, the bottom left. And then the unspoken list on the bottom right. And we're going to add two or three more to your list. So if you'd like to write these in, go ahead. Uh, The first one is, uh, this is from the Schuberts. And pray for um, the overturn of Roe vs. Wade. And uh, I'm going to mention something about that in the message tonight. Uh, But I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have heard uh, that uh, a draft came out from the Supreme Court with the possibility of uh, overturning that to the states. In other words, it would be up to each state. And uh, so uh, pray for God's will to be done in that and uh, also for the protection of those judges uh, because there's a lot of crazies out there. So we need to pray. And then this is from Linda Lulo. 
And this is uh, uh, their nephew. This would be Tony, Linda's nephew. Only three years old, and he was diagnosed with leukemia. So pray for that, uh, that uh, little boy's name is Trip. Is that his name? Okay, so T-R-I-P-P. And uh, just three years old, pray for him as he's been diagnosed with leukemia. And uh, God bless the family. All right, this time we'll go to the Lord in prayer. And Yes, there was one more here. This is the visitor's card here. And then I, okay, I, I'm sorry. I probably put something on top of it, maybe? No, I don't see it. Okay, go ahead and tell us. If you'd fill the one, go ahead and tell us. Was it something else? Okay, you sure? All right, then. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening thankful for a God that answers prayer and thankful, Lord, for the blessings you give us every day. And Lord, we come to you with these needs and uh, these uh, requests. And Father, we uh, pray for this little boy, a trip. We pray that, Lord, if, if it would be your will, Lord, that you would heal him. And uh, Lord, if not, give him grace. And, and uh, Lord, help the doctors to be able to treat him. I know that it, it can be treatable and I pray that uh, for the family, that you'd give them strength and grace during this difficult time. Pray for the, also for the uh, Ledvina family that lost uh, a mother and a and a, um, a a mom, a mother and a mother-in-law, and uh, and uh, many loved ones are are um, grieving now. And I pray for them for grace. And also for this overturn of Roe versus Wade, pray, Father, that, uh, uh, Lord, our nation would uh, wake up to revival. And this is, a, this is a, a step. This is certainly a step to that direction, that America would turn its face back to you and, and, uh, and that we would, as a nation, that we would uh, seek righteousness and, and, and do the right thing. And, uh, Lord, we just pray, Father, uh, that uh, you would keep these judges, uh, uh, conf- keep them firm in, in what they, uh, Lord, want to do. And it looks like it's, uh, it's a good thing. So, uh, Father, pray for that. I pray for, um, Lord, these other requests. Bless Dennis Hobart. I pray that he'll recover, completely recover from his surgery. Thank you that it was successful. And we pray for also Barb Snyder and Margaret Timko and Cheryl Cleland and Barb Bolton, Kathleen John Gennard, for Tyler and for Caitlin Gennard as well. And uh, pray, Father, uh, that your hand of healing would be upon these. Bless the cancer list, the unspoken list. And Father, we pray your blessings upon this weekend, big weekend. Every, every Sunday is important. Uh, but Lord, we are looking at both uh, Saturday and Sunday, uh, the ladies' meeting, and the also the um, the Mother's Day Sunday. And we pray that you'll give the Nichols traveling mercies. We pray that you'll anoint them as they minister to us this Sunday and Saturday. We pray, Lord, that you'll just give Brother Nichols power as he preaches. We pray that you give Mrs. Nichols also the uh, your help and anointing as she speaks to the ladies. Bless as they minister to, us, minister to us in song and music as well. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is the next hero of the faith. Last week we, we studied the life of Isaiah. And in fact, the last two weeks we studied the life of Isaiah And tonight, we're going to go to the next major prophet. How many of you understand when I talk about major prophets and minor prophets? Okay. There are uh, four major prophets in the Bible, in the Old Testament. They are Isaiah. Okay. See if you can can, uh, quote them with me. Then you have Jeremiah. Then you have Ezekiel. And then you have Daniel. Those are considered the four major prophets. All the rest of them, from Hosea to Malachi, 
are considered the minor prophets. Really, there's no such thing as a minor prophet, uh, just like there's no such thing as a minor Christian. Uh, they're all important, uh, but uh, uh, those four, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and, and uh, uh, Daniel, are put in that category of being major, probably because the books are longer, I guess. There's, there's a, you know, a lot more prophecies from them, but uh, so that's how that is categorized. Uh, we're going to look at Jeremiah uh, this evening and another tremendous man of God, a tremendous example and in, in, in a life dedicated to the Lord. And uh, so uh, we look at the life of Jeremiah, uh, who was a, a prophet over the land of Judah, just like Isaiah was. He was not the prophet of the northern kingdom. He was a prophet of the southern kingdom, which we will learn a little bit more in just a bit. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, hold, hold off on that, but uh, let's uh, go, let's look at some of the passages. Have your Bibles open, first of all, to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, let's go there, and we're going to look at uh, who was Jeremiah. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, review his life, take a look, at, it's a snapshot, I guess, of his life, and then we'll get into a couple lessons that I have from the life of Jeremiah. So who was Jeremiah? Well, first of all, he was the son of Hilkiah, a priest from the land of Benjamin in the village of Anathoth. So look at Jeremiah 1 in verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin. So we know who his dad was. We know that that, uh, that Jeremiah was a Benjamite. That means he was from the tribe of Benjamin, and he was from a village in Judah called Anathoth. Another thing we know about Jeremiah is he lived during the reigns of, and we'll take a look at the, at the, uh, the slide here, uh, he lived during the reigns of these seven kings. That's a lot of kings. Uh, he, he, uh, was, he came about uh, during the time of Manasseh. Uh, he was born during that time. So he lived during the time of Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoiaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, uh, who was the last king of Judah right before the captivity. Uh, Manasseh was a very evil king. Ammon was, was also a wicked king. Josiah was a great king. In fact, a revival broke out under Josiah. Jehoiaz, uh, not so good. Jehoiakim, him either. Jehoiachin, him either. And Zedekiah was also a bad king. So there was one good king out of those seven uh, that, uh, during the life of Jeremiah. And uh, so uh, now those were the seven kings that, that uh, he lived through, so to speak. Uh, but he was called by God to be a prophet to Judah, beginning with King Josiah until King Zedekiah and then into the Babylonian captivity. So look with me in uh, verse 2, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 2. To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. So there you go. He began uh, prophesying. He began as a prophet uh, during the reign of King Josiah. Look at verse 3. And it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive in the fifth month. So, he was a prophet from Josiah, all the way to Zedekiah, and into the Babylonian captivity, he remained a prophet as he stayed in the land of Judah after the captivity took place. We'll mention a little bit more of that in just a little bit. Another thing we know about Jeremiah is that uh, the, he, he, was, uh, he, was, he succeeded the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah preceded him. In other words, Isaiah was before him. Uh, he was earlier, and then came Jeremiah. 
We also know that uh, Jeremiah was ordained by God to be a prophet in his mother's womb. I want you to look at verse 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Uh, that's a, this a, you know, some people will say, where is it saying in the Bible that, you know, uh, that, that uh, you know, you shouldn't abort? I think this is a pretty good one right here. What do you think? I mean, uh, before it says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Aren't you glad that Jeremiah's mother didn't abort him? Huh? God called him from the womb. God knew Jeremiah from his, from his mother's womb, as, 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 it, as uh, it says here. And uh, so he was called by God uh, to be a prophet, ordained by the Lord from his mother's womb. Obviously, he had to surrender later in his life, but uh, it was God's calling upon him uh, to be a prophet all the way from the womb. Uh, he was known as the weeping prophet. And I think that's pretty obvious why. The reason is because he wept. He wept over the people. Uh, he had a heart for the people. He had a heart uh, for the nation uh, of Judah. And he had a broken heart as well when the people would sin and turn against God. So he was known as the weeping prophet. Now, Jeremiah lived in the final days of the crumbling nation of Judah when it came to an end. It is possible that Jeremiah had an incurable disease. I want you to go to chapter 15. Go to Jeremiah 15. So go a few chapters uh, over. And uh, Jeremiah chapter 15 and look at verse 18. 15, 18. It says, uh, here's Jeremiah and he says this. Why is my pain perpetual? And my wound incurable, which refuseth to be healed. Wilt thou be altogether unto me as a liar and as waters that fail? Now some would say, well, that's referring uh, to, his, uh, to a spiritual wound. Or they might say that's referring to uh, a, you know, pain in his heart and a spiritual type of a, of a wound. But it very well could be that uh, Jeremiah had some type of incurable disease. Another thing about Jeremiah that we know, go to chapter 16, go to the next chapter over. We know this, that God had forbidden him to marry or have children. To marry and have children. Look at uh, verse 1 of chapter 16. The word of the Lord came also unto me, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife, Neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place. So he was told by, by the Lord not to marry and, uh, and, and therefore no children. So uh, that's an interesting thing about Jeremiah. Jeremiah preached for about 40 years. He preached judgment upon Judah. Why? Because of their sin. Look at uh, chapter 16 again. Look at verse 10. Uh, here's an idea of how he preached. And it came to pass, when thou shalt show this people all these words, and they shall say unto thee, Wherefore hath the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then shalt thou say unto them, this is God telling Jeremiah, Because your fathers hath forsaken me, saith the Lord, and have walked at their other gods, and have served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law. And ye have done worse than your fathers. For behold, ye walk every one after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. Therefore will I cast you out of this land, into a land that ye know not. This refers to the Babylonian captivity. Neither ye nor your fathers, and there shall ye serve other gods day and night, where I will uh, not show you favor. So that's an example of his, how he preached judgment upon Judah because of their sin. We also know this, and 
If you were here Sunday morning uh, and you remember the message that I preached on Sunday morning about why I can't quit, uh, we went to Jeremiah uh, and we looked at Jeremiah and how he was uh, persecuted. Uh, he was uh, thrown in jail more than once, thrown in prison, thrown in the stocks. Uh, so he was very persecuted. Why? Because of the messages that he preached uh, condemning the sin, uh, the sins of the people and of the authorities. So he was persecuted for his preaching. Go to chapter 20. Take a quick look at that. And uh, we, we mentioned this on, on Sunday morning. Now Pasher, the son of Emmer, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Pasher smote Jeremiah the prophet, put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. So he was persecuted. Now when Nebuchadnezzar came in and defeated Judah and destroyed Jerusalem, he took many captives to Babylon. Now one thing that he did is for some reason, I believe this was the Lord, but Nebuchadnezzar actually favored Jeremiah. In other words, he, he, uh, he respected Jeremiah. And the Babylonian king actually went into Judah and released Jeremiah from prison. He took him out of the prison and he told Jeremiah to take care of the people that would be left in the land of Judah. Um, the people that were taken captive uh, to Babylon were the upper class and the middle class. That's what the Babylonians, that, that's who they took. And they left all the poor in the land of Judah. So they, uh, the, and, and by the way, uh, three prophets represent those three classes. Uh, we believe that Daniel was one of those upper class young men uh, that was taken. And uh, we believe that Daniel was from a wealthier family. And uh, so Daniel was more or less the prophet to the wealthy or to the rich. He was the, the prophet that went with the upper class into Babylon. And then the middle class, those were the craftsmen, you know, the, 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 the workers and the, uh, uh, you know, the, those that, uh, uh, you know, the, that did different types of skills and things of that nature. And uh, the middle class was taken as well. If anybody had a skill uh, or, or something like that, then uh, Nebuchadnezzar wanted them and took them. Uh, now, Ezekiel, we believe, was from the middle class. So, Daniel was the prophet to the rich. Ezekiel was the prophet to the middle class. And Jeremiah was the prophet to the poor, to the lower class. He stayed in Judah because the poor were not taken out of the land uh, into Babylon. So, that gives you an idea uh, of how that captivity uh, went. And so, but he was taken out of prison by Nebuchadnezzar and told to take care of the people. He was also forced to go to Egypt later on. Um, uh, some of the people that were there uh, in Judah, uh, some of the, those that were left in authority, decided to go down to Egypt. They rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, and he was actually forced to go down to Egypt. And I think I have a slide of that. And uh, well, this is when he was in the dungeon here. And, uh, and there was one time that he was put down in a, in a pit. Another time he was in stocks in jail. Another time he was in prison. And, uh, but he was forced to go to Egypt. And, uh, and down in Egypt, he prophesied. Uh, chapters 43 through 52, the end of the book, is, are all prophecies that he did in Egypt. Um, Jewish tradition teaches us that he was stoned to death in Egypt. So we believe that he died there. Uh, now, of course, we know that Jeremiah wrote the books of Jeremiah and what? Lamentations. Those are both books that Jeremiah wrote and uh, which kind of uh, reflects the, the, the fact that he was the weeping prophet. He is quoted often in the New Testament, several times in the New Testament. Uh, you'll... Uh, There'll be some kind of a quote from, uh, from Jeremiah, either Lamentations or the book of Jeremiah. Sometimes his name's even mentioned. I'll give you an example. Matthew chapter 2. Uh, Matthew, the, 
the author of, of this gospel mentions him. He says, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. This is hundreds of years later. Uh, in Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. What's that about? You remember when the King Herod sent the soldiers into Bethlehem to kill all of the baby boys, all of the boys uh, two years and, and younger? And that's the prophecy that talked about that. Rachel weeping for her children. All those boys, two and under, were slaughtered by King Herod because he was trying to get baby Jesus, get the Lord Jesus. And so that's a reference to Jeremiah, which is in the book of Jeremiah several times uh, throughout the, uh, the, the New Testament. You'll see some references from uh, the writings of Jeremiah. Let's look at what his name means. Uh, the, the meaning of the name Jeremiah, it's from the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew name appointed by God. And he certainly was. All the way from the womb, he was appointed by God to be a prophet uh, to the land of Judah and really to the world. Uh, let's look at a couple lessons this evening uh, that uh, we get from the life of Jeremiah. There, there's a whole lot more than that, but I just want to give you two. And the first one is this. Uh, plain and simple, uh, Jeremiah wept. He was the weeping prophet. And with this, let's go ahead and look at some passages. Look at some, some examples of the weeping prophet, if you will, please. And they're up there if you want to look at those. But go with me back to chapter 9 and verse 1. Chapter 9 and verse 1. It says, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong one there. I'm sorry. And I went back a little bit too far there. Okay, 9-1. Oh, that my head were waters, and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. And, uh, and then in 13, chapter 13, and verse number 17, it says, But if ye will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride. And mine eyes shall weep sore and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. In uh, chapter 14 and verse 17, Therefore thou shalt say this word unto them, Let mine eyes run down with tears night and day, and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people is broken with a great breach, with a grievous blow. And then uh, one more in chapter 31, and uh, Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse number 16. 31, 16, Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping, and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. Uh, I mean, the Lord even had to tell him a few times uh, uh, not to weep, uh, because he wept so much. He was the weeping prophet Jeremiah loved God and Jeremiah loved righteousness and Jeremiah loved people especially the people of Israel the people of Judah and that my friends is a formula for a lot of tears when you love deeply for people uh, that is usually the formula for tears and I want to mention some things about tears for the next few minutes and what the Bible has to say about tears and crying and weeping and, and, and that type of thing. So let's see several things. First of all, tears are a part of life. I think we all agree with that. Tears are a part of life. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1, To everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Then, then jump to verse 4. A time to weep, and a time to laugh, and a time to mourn. So tears are a part of life. When God created us, He gave us the ability to be emotional. That includes crying and weeping and tears. Uh, everybody sheds tears on occasion. Men, women, and children. A baby is born crying. 
you know, comes out of the womb crying usually. And uh, I, I, I read a study the other day as I was preparing this. A study says that women cry five to ten times more than men. Now, why? And it gave the reason why, at least the reason they thought. Uh, this is from a study from 2012 that found that women have 60% more prolactin, which is a reproductive hormone that stimulates the production of milk in women after childbirth, than the, of course, uh, and, and more prolactin, way more than a male. So uh, emotional tears are especially high in prolactin, which could explain why women cry more often than men. Other hormones could also play a role. And uh, I thought that was interesting. But tears are a part of life. Sometimes we cry tears of sadness, and sometimes we cry tears of joy. But tears are a part of life. Wouldn't you agree? And then next, tears, they come and go. Tears come and go. I don't think that anybody has, 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 has cried 24-7 your entire life, okay? Now, uh, tears do come and they go. Psalm 30 and verse 5, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Crying doesn't last forever, even though it may seem like it. For the Christian, the born-again child of God, crying may last for a while, but joy will come whenever you are encouraged by the Holy Spirit and the Lord. Another thing about tears is that God sees our tears. Did you know that God sees every tear that you shed? Did you know God hears you when you cry and hears you when you weep? The Lord sees and hears our tears. He is compassionate and He's understanding. I, I believe that, that the Lord uh, understands when we cry. Look at Psalm 34. It says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and His ears are open unto their cry. God always hears our cries. He, he, he sees our tears every single drop. And I believe that, that the Lord sometimes cries with us when we, when we cry. And then another thing is the Lord collects our tears. Do you know that? Say, why in the world would the Lord collect our tears? I really don't know why. But he does. Psalm 56, 8 says, Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Isn't that interesting? Um, apparently, the Lord keeps track of our tears. He counts them. And he puts them in a bottle, and he also puts them in a book. That's how much God loves us. That's how much he cares for us, and he is attentive to our sorrows. He actually keeps track of our tears. Another thing is we know that Jesus shed tears. Did he not? Our Lord and Savior, when he was on earth, he shed tears. This is one example Famous verse, uh, the shortest verse in the Bible, uh, John eleven thirty five. 35. This is the first verse I memorized. And, and, and I hope you have it memorized. How many have this memorized? All right, I hope you do. Uh, Jesus wept. Jesus shed tears. Our Lord shed tears many times during his lifetime here on earth. And I believe that, that sometimes he still sheds tears. And uh, our Lord wept and shed tears. Why? Because Jesus became a man. He was 100% man, but he was also 100% God. But he was 100% man. He felt emotion, just like we do. He, he, he would get emotional sometimes. Uh, it's, not, it's not a sin to be emotional. It, it, it's, it's a sin if you let those emotions carry you away and, and cause you to... To, to do other things you shouldn't do or say things you shouldn't say or not trust the Lord or whatever. Uh, but uh, emotions uh, in themselves are not bad. Uh, but uh, Jesus wept. Of course, Jesus was without sin. Jesus shed tears. And you know what that means? That means that um, he, he felt emotion just like we do. And I also believe that means that he understands when we, when we cry. 
He understands when we shed tears because he also uh, was very emotional at times and understood sadness and sorrow. Uh, another thing about tears is the unsaved, those that, that don't know Christ as Savior, when they die, if a person dies without Christ, uh, the unsaved will weep for all of eternity in hell. Think about that. Think about weeping for all of eternity uh, in Matthew 8, 12. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That describes that awful place called hell. Can you imagine weeping for all of eternity? But here's the good news. Here's the flip side. Uh, the saved will have their tears wiped away in heaven. And we'll never cry again after they're wiped away. Revelation 21, 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now you have a choice if you're watching online or maybe you're here in person. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, uh, I, 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 I encourage you, I beg you, please don't be in this category. Uh, don't be... Um, one of the ones that will die without Christ and weep for all of eternity, I hope that you're one of these, the saved, the born-again child of God that will have all tears wiped away and there'll be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. And uh, that's, that's something to look forward to. And what a contrast between the saved and the unsaved. The sa unsaved will weep forever. The saved will never cry Again, you know, it's interesting that it says he will wipe away our tears. Talks about the new Jerusalem, talks about going into heaven, talks about him wiping our tears away. Then, then it says there'll be no more crying, no more sorrow. You ever wondered why he'll wipe our tears away in heaven? I have a theory. Can I share it with you? I'm not saying that this is absolutely a fact or the truth. It's just something I think it might be. I believe that when the great white throne judgment takes place, when all the unsaved will stand before the Lord at the great white throne to be judged, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I believe we will witness that judgment. I believe perhaps we will see loved ones and friends cast into the lake of fire. And I believe that we'll shed tears. And I believe that those tears will be wiped away. And look what it says at the, at the last part of that verse. For the former things are passed away. I believe that those loved ones will be wiped away from our memory. Former things passed away. Tears, all the tears will be wiped away. And then I believe it will be taken out of our memories. It would be hard to enjoy heaven for eternity if you had a son or a daughter or a grandchild or a mother or a dad that was in hell. That's just my, my theory on that. But it does say that he'll wipe away our tears, amen, and, uh, and, and we'll never cry again. We know that for certain. These are facts according to Scripture. We'll be wiped away, and praise the Lord, we'll never, ever cry again. Wonderful thing. Uh, so these are things about tears. Now, when should a Christian weep? Is it okay to weep? I think there's, there, there's times where we should weep. I think there's times that we should shed tears. When should a Christian weep? First of all, uh, I believe during fervent prayer. I'm not saying we have to cry every time we pray. I'm not saying we have to weep every time we come before the Lord. But I believe many times we ought to weep. I believe in fervent prayer. Look what Psalm uh, chapter uh, uh, 39 and verse 12 tells us. It says, Hear my prayer, O Lord. 
Give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears. This is the psalmist crying out to God. This is prayer. When prayer is fervent, when you are desperate for God to answer, when you cry out to Him, there's going to be tears. You're going to cry. I'm, I'm sure all of us would probably raise our hands and say, there's been times where we've wept when we prayed. Fervent prayer. It tells us in, in Psalm 69, verse 3, I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. That's prayer. That's seeking God. Uh, we find in, in Isaiah, uh, uh, it says that, and I won't read all of this, but you remember the story when Hezekiah was sick and he was told to put his house in order and the prophet told him, Isaiah told him, you're going to die. And, and Hezekiah wept. Remember that? He wept and he pleaded with God to give him 15 more, give him more time. And, uh, and God granted that prayer. But he wept. He wept sore. And God gave him how many more years? 15 more years. Gave him 15 more years. Another uh, passage is Mark 9, 24, when a man, a father of a child that wanted his, his child healed by Jesus, uh, he cried out to the Lord and, and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. So uh, when should we weep? I believe we should weep during fervent prayer. Fervent prayer. Agonizing prayer, if you will. Another time is when the shame of sin comes. Hey, when we, when we sin, uh, and uh, uh, I believe that uh, uh, when sin comes, or, or excuse me, with sin comes guilt, and with guilt comes shame. At least there should be shame. When we sin against God and displease Him, shouldn't we be ashamed? Yes, we should. And uh, uh, there is... Uh, uh, there, you know, there is uh, little to no shame when an unbeliever sins. But when a Christian sins, there should be shame. And with shame comes weeping. And that is what happened to Peter when Peter denied the Lord three times. And this is that passage, Matthew 26, 75. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus. Remember the cock crew? Remember the rooster? I mean, he denied him three times. And then the, the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out, and what did he do? Wept bitterly, bitterly, uh, because of shame, when, with the shame of sin. And uh, do you weep when you sin? I hope so. Do you weep when you displease or disobey the Lord? Another reason we should weep is when there's repentance. When there's repentance. And, and uh, uh, many times re, uh, repentance, when a Christian repents and a Christian gets right with the Lord, and there's uh, many times tears that go with that. Uh, I believe that repentance leads to weeping. Now you don't have to weep when you repent, but a broken spirit and a broken heart uh, will bring, that, bring those tears. You know, David repented of his sins. And David had a broken heart over it. Right here in, in Psalm 51, 17. He says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. Contrite's another uh, word for repentance. A repentant heart. He was sorry for his sin. He, he, he wanted to get right with God. And he had a broken spirit and a broken heart. And uh, it says, God thou wilt not despise. And uh, I believe that brings tears. Another, uh, uh, by the way, God responds to our tears with forgiveness when, we, when we're honest and sincere. If you truly come to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I'm sorry, forgive me. Uh, Lord, I, I've sinned, I've done wrong, I've disobeyed you. Uh, there's forgiveness when we are honest and sincere. But God is faithful and just, who will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful and just. Another reason that we... We, we can weep or we should weep, is sowing the seed of the gospel with compassion. You know, there are times when you're trying to reach someone for Christ. There are times when you witness to somebody, especially someone you love and care for, that you ought to do it with compassion. And compassion, I believe, brings tears. 
Jude 22, and of some have compassion, making a difference. When we witness, when we seek to win souls, we should have compassion. A compassion brings tears, weeping for the lost. And Psalm 126, they that sow in what? Tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. But sometimes it takes tears. Sometimes we have to sow into, sometimes we have to cry, sometimes we have to weep over sinners. And, uh, and sometimes we, we pray to God for sinners and we weep. Sometimes we go to that person. I've had tears many times uh, when I've talked to someone. Please get saved. Please tr- trust Christ as Savior. And so there's that, uh, there's weeping when we sow the gospel with compassion. Our Lord wept over souls. Our Lord Jesus. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Our Lord had compassion and he wept over the multitudes. Uh, When is the last time that you wept over a soul, over someone you're burdened for, someone that needs to be saved? Another reason that we, uh, we weep is for our countrymen and nation when they sin. For our, for our nation. Jeremiah 9, verse 1. Jeremiah talks about that. and He talks about his people. He talks about his nation. In Jeremiah 9, he says, Oh, that my head were waters, and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. He wept over his people. He wept for his countrymen and his nation because of their sin. And you and I, we should weep over the sin of our nation, America. When's the last time you wept for your nation? Uh, We should weep over the wickedness of our leaders, the promotion of unrighteousness in our institutions of learning. We should weep over the murder of innocent babies. We should weep over the apostasy of our churches. We should weep over the worldliness of Christians. These are reasons to weep. You know, Paul wept over his nation. Paul said this in Romans 10, 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Another reason that we can weep or should weep is when we warn others. When we warn others. We should weep when we warn the lost of an eternal hell. We should weep when we warn Christians of Satan's plan to destroy them. We should weep when we warn our children and and our grandchildren who might be on the wrong path. We should weep when we warn those we influence, those that we have the opportunity to influence. and, And for Christ, we should warn them of the dangers of sin, especially Christians. Paul did just that in Acts 20, verse 31. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with what? Tears. Paul went about warning people. Please don't, please be careful. Please, Satan wants to sift you as wheat. Satan wants to attack you, wants to destroy you. Satan wants your children. Satan wants your marriage. Uh, Please be careful. Don't follow that path. Don't go down that road. Hey, don't do that. Paul warned with tears. Sometimes we need to warn with tears. Then another reason why we would weep is when a loved one dies. I mentioned earlier, I conducted a funeral this morning, and people were gathered because a loved one had passed. When a loved one dies, it's natural for us to weep. It's natural for us to cry. Tears are shed when one we love dies, especially if that loved one is not saved. Even if the loved one is saved, we'll miss that person until we see them again in heaven. David wept over those that had, some that had passed. We example is Absalom. His own son was killed in battle. And he cried out. It says here, he says he went up to the chamber over the gate and he wept. As he went, thus he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. 
Would God I had died for thee, O Absalom, my son, my son. He wept over the death of his son, naturally. And uh, many people wept when Lazarus died, including his sister Mary. And uh, it says the Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, following her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Mary wept, Martha wept, uh, and Jesus wept, by the way, uh, over that incident and uh, the losing of Lazarus' death. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, we also see that uh, people wept when Dorcas died. Tabitha was another name. And when she passed, it talked about how Peter rose, went with him. When he was come, they, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping. They're weeping and showing the coats and the garments which, which Dorcas made while she was with them. So they wept over her. So it's natural to weep over uh, someone when they pass. And then I've got uh, two more, and I'm done. Another reason that we, we weep is we weep with those who weep. Weep with those who weep. The uh, Bible tells us that in Romans 12. Rejoice with them that rejoice. You know when someone's rejoicing and they're blessed and they're praising God, man, you ought to praise God with them. Amen? Somebody has a blessing or a praise, you ought to, you ought to be thankful. You ought to rejoice with them. Don't be jealous. Don't be envious. Rejoice when people rejoice. Be glad. But if someone's brokenhearted, weep with them that weep. Weep with them that weep. Sometimes we should weep with those who are hurting. Not necessarily for the same reason they are, they are weeping, but we weep with them and we weep for them. Sometimes it's just plain old comforting when someone weeps with you. And um, lastly, we can weep when someone leaves. And says goodbye. Don't you hate goodbyes? You hate goodbyes. Paul experienced that in Acts 20. When Paul was leaving the, the good people of Ephesus. When he was about ready to get on that ship and go to Jerusalem. They all wept sore. And fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. Sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Sometimes we weep when we have to say goodbye. You know, because God has called me most of my life, most of my ministry, these 40 years, he's called me for the most part to be a church planter and a missionary. And I've had to say goodbye over and over, too many times. And it's never easy. When I was a youth pastor in Bourbon A, before we went to Argentina, I had to say goodbye to those good people. Uh, when I was in Argentina, uh, and being there 15 years with those people, and I remember how hard that was to say goodbye. And um, the Lord was bringing us back to the States for other ministries, and we had turned the work over uh, to the uh, nationals there. And uh, we had our last Sunday, and all we did was have fellowships, and, you know, and it was goodbye and goodbye, and they gave us gifts, and they, 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 they hugged us. And, and in Argentina, they do a lot of kissing and hugging, and that's the way they greet. And uh, so after uh, that night, after the Sunday night service, we went back home, to spend the last night in Argentina, and the next morning we were going to get on the plane and go back to the States. And we thought, well, goodbyes are over, and oh, that was hard. And uh, thankfully, tomorrow we don't have to go through that again. And so we got to the airport, and when we got to the airport, there was about 50 of our people to say goodbye again, <laughs> put us through misery again. <laughs> and, and as we said goodbye... I know what Paul feels like. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing. Uh, and uh, it's hard to say goodbye. And uh, I came back and served about three years in Bourbonnais and 
Say goodbye again because the Lord called me to Aurora to start a brand new church. And I started that church, pastored that for eight years, and then uh, had to say goodbye to those people. And, uh, and I, hate, I hate goodbyes. Um, I'm hoping that the next time I say goodbye is when the Lord takes me to heaven. That's, that's what I'm hoping. And, uh, but uh, these are reasons why we weep. These are reasons why we shed tears. And uh, I think they're all worthy reasons and good reasons. And because of time, we're not going to uh, go into the second lesson that, that I take from the life of, I, of Jeremiah, excuse me. And uh, basically, it's what I preached on Sunday morning. Uh, the, second, the second point was simply this. I won't get into it. But Jeremiah would not quit. That was Sunday morning's message. So if you want to know about that, then get online and pull up the message. But that's point two. Jeremiah would not quit. And uh, so these are some lessons we take from Jeremiah. But the main one is he was the weeping prophet. So I wanted to talk about tears tonight and, and weeping and, and, uh, and what God says about that in his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that uh, uh, you have given us tears to use. And Lord, tears, we pray that our tears would be right tears. And Lord, we pray that, uh, Lord, you would use our tears for your glory and honor. Thank you for Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. We pray that we can have that same heart, same compassion, same love for people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. All right. Uh, so don't forget, ladies, this Saturday and then the um, Mother's Day Sunday. Don't forget that. God bless you. We'll need some help. Uh, some of you guys, uh, men, could help us out. We appreciate that. You're dismissed. God bless you.